important godly leadership. This is what I was asked to uh, to speak on. And uh, I, I tell you, I, I was really excited to explore this and uh, I'm excited to learn from you as we go through it together. I'll begin with uh, just sharing with you an outline. This is roughly what we're doing. We're going to talk about vision and values, language that you often hear. Come on, Joe, quick. What was that? Sorry. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> um, so, Fiona, I haven't had you ask any questions in class, so that was nice if, to, to hear your voice, <laughs> if that was you. Um, the, the, fir the first section here is vision and values plus uh, story, all right? I'll explain a little bit more. And then we're going to look at identifying the called before we talk about investing in the called. So there's the plan. And at the end of all three of these sessions, we'll stop for some breakout discussions together. Okay, here we go. First, uh, vision and values. And I'm guessing since you are all leaders that you've heard this language quite a bit, vision and values. Uh, I, I think often the leadership literature that is published, uh, perhaps particularly from my own country, uh, vision is a big deal, isn't it? You hear a lot about this. You go to leadership conferences, you hear about vision. You've got to have a vision for your church. You've got to have a vision for your organization, your ministry. And vision, I think, is basically, it has to do with our sense of direction, our sense of uh, what our aspirations are for the church and organization that we may lead. Uh, vision is what we have our sights set on in the near and distant horizons. And the vision may be to, to grow membership, maybe to make more disciples, maybe the vision is to engage more in your community. These are all noble visions as visions go. But you can go about a good vision in a bad way, can't you? Which is why we also, as Christian leaders, we want to tag into vision values. We, we don't want to have, have an excellent vision that sounds great on paper, but pursue it in a way that lacks integrity or, or that fails to reflect kingdom characteristics. So vision's important, but vision with our values held in place. Well, I, I want to I want to add a uh, the idea of story to this. As we move into a discussion on investing in godly leaders, identifying godly leaders, I want to suggest that alongside all of the this talk with vision and value, we must also recognize vision, value, and story. All right, story, a narrative implies a sequence, right? Stories have sequences. They, you, you open up a book and there are page numbers. <clears throat> a story implies sequence. And for Christian leaders, the primary story that we are all a part of is the story of God's unfolding mission over time in, the his, in history, but also in the present and in the future. And we are a part of this bigger story. I think a helpful verse for this is in John 4, when Jesus tells his disciples, others have labored, and you, you have entered into their labor, their, their labor. So what, what I'm getting at, the, the reason this is important for leadership, the reason story is important for thinking about what it means to lead, is because we find ourselves as leaders in the midst of an ongoing sequence an ongoing story. And it's a story that's bigger than any of us. Our churches are mapped into it, into this overarching narrative. Our leadership falls within it, but our leadership is also going to fall or fade out of that story over time. If, if you read a story, if you read, say, a long novel, and the novel spans more than, let's say, 100 years, then whatever main characters were at the beginning, they're not going to be there, are they, at the end of the book? We're part of a very long, broad story. Others have labored. We have entered into their labor, but someone else will enter into our 
labor. If we think of ourselves as leaders, as having vision and values, and also as having an eye on the story, then we recognize that we, as leaders, are replaceable. <laughs> we are replaceable. There, there is a temptation, I think, in leadership to think of ourselves as irreplaceable. And we have our vision so cast for the immediate. The vision is cast for our own ministry. Maybe the values are in place. And that's good. That's important. But if we don't have a sense of the bigger story, of which we're just a small part, that our investment in the next chapters coming up may not be as strong. So I just want to have a collective sense here together that we should have vision for our churches, for the association, for our region. We should pursue that vision with the values of Christ's kingdom. But we must also recognize that we're part of a story. And that story involves characters who are, we've not even met yet, Characters who, um, or maybe we've met them and we don't even know or recognize their significance in that story yet. We want to be good members, good participants of the story, where their eye is open for who God may be bringing into certain character roles that we can help develop. All right? So vision and values plus story. And that's going to lead us into our first breakout session. This isn't going to be very long, all right, but I want us to, uh, to discuss these questions in our breakout groups, all right? What is the story of your church and your ministry, and where are you personally as a minister, as a minister in training, as a leader, where are you in the timeline, all right? Of course, now, moving on to uh, part two, <clears throat> identifying the call. We'll take a bit more time here before we break out into our groups. Uh, let's see. Yeah, identifying the called and the, <laughs> the boat with the fisherman's net is supposed to be, well, it's supposed to connote Jesus calling the disciples, isn't it? So I'm, I'm sure you picked up on that. All right, here we go. Uh, identifying the called. And I just am going to give uh, a handful of fairly practical ideas of how we might do this, might possibly do this. Uh, for one, I think it's important for us to create a context. What I mean is to be able to create an environment in which people are inspired to be leaders, in which leadership is something that uh, is is valued and in which leadership is something that we as leaders or as ministers can, can observe happening. And by, by suggesting that we create a context in which we can identify prospective leaders in which we can see others leading, I don't mean that we necessarily create an easy context. <laughs> Often, the only real context in which leadership can be observed, or at least the best sort of context in which leadership can be observed, is a challenging context, isn't it? And uh, I, I think we see this, for instance, uh, in, in Jerusalem, in the church in Jerusalem. You notice, you'll remember the book of Acts, that uh, the apostles have been doing their work of preaching and proclaiming the word, and uh, and if you do that, if you do your job well enough, then you, you generate other problems, right? For instance, people need to eat. And there are Greeks and there are, there, there are Jews and there are Greeks, or at least Hellenistic Jews. And, and there's been a problem with who gets fed when, who's eating when. And it's a lot of people to feed. And as Baptists, you know, we, we, we like feeding people. We know, we know that's central to fellowship. Well, what happens when there are uh, disputes? Well, one of the ways that you create a context for developing leaders is you as the leader decide what you're not going to do in that context. And that's exactly what happened with the apostles. They said, look, we've got our hands full proclaiming the word. Choose for yourselves some people who can sort out the mess here that we're now dealing with. And the apostles let it happen. They, part of creating a context 
is being able to allow problems to surface. It's not to create a problem-free context. It's to allow those problems to maybe come to the surface. And in that process, we can begin to see uh, who may be aspiring to lead, who may be aspiring to serve in a sort of um, ministerial capacity. So creating a context, and that's something I look forward to talking with you more about in our breakout groups in just a moment. Uh, also, Ephesus and Crete are two contexts that we will be thinking about a bit more this morning, or at least they'll be in the background of discussion because I am drawing much of this material from 1 and 2 Timothy and from Titus. And if you have your Bibles nearby, it may be helpful just to be there. We'll get to a couple of texts here in a moment. <clears throat> but identifying the called involves creating a context. I, I, I want to just emphasize this before moving to the next point, because I, I'm... You know, I've been around in the Northeast. Well, I've been here for nine years, but six years leading the free church track before I stepped down um, back in August. And one thing that I have noticed is that um, in, in a number of churches in the Northeast that I've been in, there hasn't really been a culture of identifying leaders. And you know, in some ways, some churches, I think, do have more of a survival mentality. You know, let's just get through <laughs> Let's get through this season, for instance, maybe COVID, or let's just get through, um, you know, the next few years here and see if we can, you know, hold on to the next um, uh, stage where this or that's going to happen. But what I've often noticed is there isn't uh, a, uh, a, a, a culture in which we are looking for who's going to lead into the next chapters. So creating a context, I think, is really important. And it doesn't have to be a pretty easy, nice context. In fact, sometimes the more challenging, the better. All right, we'll talk more about that in the breakout groups. When it comes to identifying a leader, we need to be ready to be surprised. <laughs> in fact, some of you, I'm sure, like me, were like Moses who was no more surprised by his own calling than by anyone else's calling. Moses was probably more shocked by his, himself being called to serve God than he was shocked by anyone else being called in his own ministry. Uh, Moses himself was surprised. God says, I'm sending you to Egypt. And of course, he protests. He can't figure out why he is not in any sense, in his own view, ideal for the task. So we need to be ready to be surprised. And this is uncomfortable. Many of us know who we want to be serving alongside. We may have already identified someone that we think God needs to call, but maybe God has called someone else and it's not the one we thought he should call. All right. Uh, I think also of David, no one was more surprised about David's calling to serve Israel than David's family. David's dad, remember the scene where the, the prophet Samuel shows up and he says, you know, I, I need to see the sons of the house of Jesse. You know, we're about to choose a king here. And uh, they all show up and they are all fine specimens who definitely look like they could live up to the vocation, to the calling. And God says, nope, to every one of them. Nope, nope, nope. Um, well, do you have any more sons left? And Jesse says, well, there is one, the sort of runt of the litter, I guess. He's out there with the sheep, but you don't really want him. And Samuel says, I'm not sitting down. I'm not going to eat until he's here. So be ready to be surprised. And Samuel himself has a fairly surprising story. You remember his own calling. He's a little boy left by his mother, Hannah, in the, in, in the tabernacle in Shiloh. And Eli and Eli's sons uh, were in charge. And Samuel hears a voice and he assumes it's Eli. This was surprising to Samuel, who was called to serve and lead God's people as a judge, and as a prophet. But it was also surprising to Eli, the existing leader, um, 
had to deal with his own surprises. Although I think when all was said and done, he, I think he realized it made much better sense than his own sons being called. So, so this is the point, be ready to be surprised. And in that same vein, I think when it comes to identifying leaders, we're ready to be surprised, but we look, we need to be actively looking for who God may be nudging. But then we need to look again and look more closely. And again, the example I'm going to provide here is the one of David. Samuel inspected every son of Jesse. There's got to be something more, something else is going on here. Are you sure this is all of them? He looked, and then he looked more closely. So, you know, as we are scanning the horizons of the future of our churches, that also means we need to be scanning the people's faces within our congregation to see who God may be prompting to lead in those new, in that new horizon. But as we look, we then need to look a bit more closely. Sometimes we think, oh, that person is obviously who God wants to call. And then maybe God says, no, there's got to be someone else. The prophet Samuel says, no, there's got to be somebody else, right? So look, but look more closely. And my final point here on this section of identifying the called is I think as we are looking, we should look for character over competence. Now, competence is extremely important. And I remember when I was at theological college, when I was in seminary in the U.S., uh, I, I sort of looked down on the professionalization of ministry and the high degree of competency that was being urged upon ministers. And, um, but then I became a minister and I realized, oh, I need to be competent. I'm supposed to know how to like manage the church budget. I'm supposed to know how to lead a business meeting now. I'm supposed to know how to actually baptize this person and dunk them properly without letting them fall into the water. You know, these are the sort of things that are important. These are important competencies. But ultimately, what we want is someone whose character is such that we can, we can come alongside this person and they'll be teachable. They can learn the competencies later over time. Or it may be that there's some competence that you definitely know your ministry needs, your church needs. But you also identify a particular leader and you know this is the right leader but yet I also need this competency and I just don't see it in this leader. It may be that God's going to raise up someone else with the competency. And we see this with Moses, with the call of Moses. Moses recognizes his lack of competency when it comes to speech. But God says, oh, no, that's fine. I've got the competency sorted out. Aaron's going to go along with you. All right. So create a context in which we can identify the call. Be ready to be surprised. Look and then look again and keep our eyes. Tra- let's keep our eyes trained on character more so than on competence. All right. OK, well, that's going to lead us into our next breakout session. And I'm going to copy and paste because I'm going I'm, I'm going to make sure that you have in the chat these questions in case you forget. OK, so. Uh, Paul, if you want to go ahead and break us up, I'm going to copy and paste this into the chat. Okay. Well, this moves into our third and final section here in our final 10 minutes together. Uh, Are are you seeing the screens again? Are we still okay, everyone? All right, good. Thumbs up from Paul there. Investing in the call. So we spent about, what, 12 minutes talking about identifying the call. Looking, looking again, creating context in which we can observe who God may be calling. We have identified those uh, in this process. Now, how do we invest in the call? All right. And investing in them. Now, obviously, we can make lists and lists of how to do this all day long. I'm just going to provide four. And these will be drawn out of the uh, pastoral epistles. Uh, one and two Timothy and in Titus. And one thing that I, I observed while preparing was that Paul reminds Timothy of his own story. Now, we talked about story at the beginning. 
And I, I think part of being a good leader is recognizing the story that we are in, being alert to the story and the dynamics of the story. And part of, I think if you're a leader who recognizes that you're a part of a story is that you're able to watch other people who are in the timeline with you, who are in the sequence of God's work with you. And this is something we see Paul having done with Timothy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, he writes, a faith that first lived in your grandmother, Lois. By the way, I had a grandmother named Lois, so I've always loved this passage. <laughs> this, is, this is one of those rare biblical uh, uh, passages that has direct specific name significance for me. So this is pretty interesting. Um, uh, and, and your mother, Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you. Th this Paul's been able to trace God's work in Timothy generationally. And that is something that uh, church leaders, uh, unlike maybe, unlike leaders in other areas, uh, like say business, for instance, uh, church leaders get to see generational stories unfolding, don't we? And Paul takes it upon himself to remind Timothy of that story that he, I've, I've been watching you for years. I've seen it in your grandmother, Lois, and I see that faith in Eunice, your mother. And, and that's why I'm reminding you to rekindle the gift that you have. I remember a while back when, you know, we laid our hands on you. I laid my hands on you and prayed for you. Do you remember that, the commissioning that you've had? So we, part of, part of investing in the call is being able to see their story and remind them of that story. Uh, I, I think this is particularly helpful for young people. Um, because sometimes when you're really young, you don't recognize that you're part of a story. You're just living day to day. So it's, it's helpful, I think, when, when usually an older <laughs> uh, leader who has been on the storyline a bit longer can remind us uh, or younger leaders of their story. All right. Uh, he also says, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was past tense given to you through prophecy with the laying on of hands by the council of elders. So. Paul has seen this faith development in Timothy's family, and he's seen it also in the life of the church. Remember when we prayed for you. Remember when I laid my hands and prayed for you. Remember when the, 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 the deacon board or the council of elders got together and, uh, and laid hands on you. So we remind people of their own story. Now, you may not be surprised to hear me, someone who has been teaching New Testament at a theological college to say something like this, teach and learn theology together. But actually theology, I think, is extremely important when it comes to investing in the called. This is a, a word that Timothy receives um, from Paul. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. Theology sustains for the long haul. Now, I don't mean, I don't mean uh, uh, babble. I don't, I don't mean, uh, well, all, all throughout these pastoral epistles, Paul tells Titus and Timothy to avoid worthless nonsensical babble, you know, controversies that are completely ridiculous. And a lot of people, I think a lot of us Baptists, we can be nervous about theology. A, a, a lot of folks in my upbringing, at least, would read, you know, the pastoral epistles and hear Paul talk about, yeah, stay away from all that useless talk. And they'll think that that's theology. Theology is the useless talk, all those controversies. No, Paul, Paul doesn't view that as theology. All throughout these pastorals, Paul talks about sound teaching, sound doctrine. It appears all throughout. It's peppered with that language. While also, he tells them, but avoid all the babble, right? And I think when it comes to ministry, those of us, I mean, we, we know, right? When it gets hard, we need more than trivial sentiments. We need more than coffee mug slogans. We need more than the worthless babble. We need sound 
doctrine, sound teaching. Our congregations need sound teaching. So this is something that we need to be helping uh, instill within the leaders, potential leaders, prospective leaders. We need to instill a sense of the purpose of theology and a sense of its significance. Here's another verse. We, this is from the instructions in Titus on, uh, on elders uh, and overseers or, or bishops, it sounds it's translated. We Baptists know it's not really bishops. It's supposed to be overseers, right? Anyway, we, we have a firm grasp. We must have a firm grasp of the word that is trustworthy in accordance with the teaching, all right? So this teach and learn theology together is really important. Now, just a few practical notes. How should we do this together? This, this can be intimidating, especially if it's been a while since you've been in theological college. Well, I think for one, we'll talk about being an example again in a moment, but uh, being an example in terms of being a theologian is when, you know, we're someone who can be observed investing in reading the Bible, thinking carefully about what's going on in society, um, maybe even reading um, other works of uh, folks who can resource us as we think about our ministry. So one, we're an example to that prospective leader, to those we're mentoring. Another practical way is just very, very simply, is to start conversations like, this is one of my favorite conversation starters. What is God teaching you this week? That's a theology question. So this is one thing you could ask your ministerial staff or folks you're training in ministry. Hey, what's God teaching you this week? You may not, it doesn't sound, the question is different. It's the same question as what theology are you thinking about? But it doesn't sound as intimidating. And then here's another idea of practically study together. You know, you could say, hey, let's look at the Bible Project, the Bible Project online. They've got a series of videos on this particular theme, theme on, on God's holiness. Why don't we watch one of those a day for this week, and then we'll just meet and have co during our coffee time and talk about it. Or you could say, hey, let's, let's read Augustine's City of God this year together. You know, let's just make it through like what, you know, three chapters a week. They're short chapters. Um, studying together. All right. That's a way of modeling theology, which will resource prospective ministers for the long haul. All right, uh, here's one I'll spend a little bit of time on uh, moving into our final discussion here. Give fellowship and receive it. So what I mean by this, in terms of investing in the call, that is a relational investment. Ministry leadership development is not just modeling good skills. It's not just teaching theology. It's not just providing training materials or sending folks off to conferences where they can learn to be better professionals. Ministry leadership development is relational investment. It is professional in that we're teaching someone to know the ropes of a job but it's also deeply personal. It's professional, but it's deeply personal. I, I remember for me, and, and this is still true in many ways, personally, I want friendship with my mentors. I don't want just, I just, I don't just want to download their information. I want their friendship, their fellowship. I want to be close to them. I want them not just to recognize my potential for a job. I want them to know me and to see me and to love me. And I'm just going to give you a number of verses where this is happening uh, in Paul. He writes to Timothy, and he calls Timothy, my child. All right, you see that? My child. He does this as well with Titus. Titus, my loyal child. This is intimate language. In this case, family language. Here's another example. To Timothy, my beloved child. Now, he's giving some intense instructions to these young men. And my apologies, uh, women, these, the examples happen to be men here in the scriptural text. But he views them, Paul views them in a family sort of dynamic, in a family relationship. 
he gives them fellowship. He is invested in them, not just as one professional to another professional, but as a father would to a child, right? As a brother to a brother. But as mentors, in investing in godly leaders, investing in the called, we also mean not just to give fellowship, but to receive fellowship from others. If you have your Bibles open, I'm just going to read briefly from this passage in 2 Timothy 4. This is 4, 9 through 18. Paul writes, do your best to come to me soon. Paul needs Timothy's friendship. Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful in my ministry. He needs friendship. You need friendship. And some of the most important friendships in our ministries may well be from those that we have invested in as mentors. Something similar is happening in Titus. Titus chapter 3 at the very end. When I send Artemis to you or Tychicus, do your best to come to me in Nicopolis, for I've decided to spend the winter there. He wants to spend the winter with Titus. And you know, I, I remember this this one young man who is, uh, he's a church planter in the U.S. He's now pastoring this church that he planted. And you know, he, he would introduce me to people as this is the guy who taught me everything I know about ministry. I, I don't know if there's hardly anyone who has ministered to me more than this young man. He views me as his greatest mentor in ministry. I, I, I have received so much from him. We, we often talk about how we wish we had a Paul. We could be a Timothy or a Titus to We need a Paul. Well, many of us, we don't just, we don't just need a Paul to us as a Timothy. We need a Timothy to us as a Paul. We need the friendship of those that we mentor. So we give and receive fellowship. And finally, the very last slide here is coming up. Paul writes, we've talked about Paul, Paul talked about being an example, but here is Paul laying it out. In 2 Timothy 3, you have observed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings. You've seen them. All right. And, you know, I just saw headlines this morning of another megachurch pastor in the U.S. who is stepping down after um, adultery, having cheated on his wife. Um very little will disillusion or destroy a leadership development culture and the failure of our mentors. So there's pressure on us, right, to be an example. Well, I, uh, I, I don't have the clock here, but I'm assuming that we're drawing near to the end. So, Paul, well, and I'm afraid we've, Tony, we've run out of time, Andy, for, for the breakout discussion, but, but we're recording it. So we've got a uh, we'll have a recording yeah. of the slide. So you can um, uh, maybe Andy as well. You could just put that into the chat for us, the questions, That's, and then we yeah. can respond to that as we go into our break. But thanks that, so much. That's what I do, Paul. No, you're very welcome. Thank you all for listening. I will put those questions in the chat room for you to talk about later. Thanks so much.